And now, welcome to the stage, Ellen McGirt and Chris Hyams. Hey, everybody. Woo. Woo. Thank you for that. Thank you for the woo. I haven't been to South by Southwest in a really long time, so I'm thrilled to be back. And thank you all for being so welcoming. And Chris, thank you for inviting me to uh, have this conversation with you today. Thank you for coming, and welcome to Austin. Oh, I do love it here. And I am feeling particularly lucky at the moment, because this is the third time I've had a chance to talk with you pretty much in the last year, which is very unusual. We. Um, you know, I've just gotten such a deep appreciation for your vision for a better world and how that plays out in your leadership, but also through technology and the just sheer joy and dignity of everyone having the right job for themselves. So we're going to dig into all of that. It was first at the Culturati Summit, and then you did a podcast for us at Fortune Leadership Next. I pestered you for quite a few weeks, and uh, thank you so very much for doing it. I, I enjoyed it. If you get a chance to listen to it, really do. Um, but I am not surprised then, but I am totally delighted that you took this opportunity, this platform, this time in front of these amazing people to help us to rethink um, what we mean when we say disruption. We are literally at the annual cathedral for disruption here, <laughs> here in Austin, where great ideas and companies come together. And wherever you are in the history of the your relationship with the internet, whether it was a term sheet or a big exit or unicorn status, you know, everybody, this was a use case for everybody from Facebook to Foursquare and Twitter and of course Uber. If you could make it here, you could scale it anywhere. So let's start with your big picture reframe. We also have jobs numbers out today. I'm gonna to ask you about your day job at Indeed in a second. Why is it, in your view, that you've come to think that we need to reconsider what disruption means for the modern age? So, I, as you said, this is, I, I like the framing of the cathedral of disruption, um, but that word gets tossed around so much, and any time a word gets used over and over and over again, it, it sort of loses its original meaning. Yeah. And uh, at Indeed, you know, our mission is to help people get jobs. We think about jobs and the meaning of work in someone's life. And so when you look at it through that lens, yes, we're a technology company and we're trying to change the way that, that people get jobs, but, um, but we see the impact of disruption. And so when I, just to frame it, so when I, when I think about disruption, the, uh, my favorite example is there's this, uh, was a circular in the Buffalo News in 1991. And it's, it's gone around the, the, the internet, but I think I first saw it about 10 years ago. And it's a Radio Shack ad from 1991, and it's a, a two-page circular, and it's got 15 products on it. And there's a, a cordless phone, there's an answering machine, there's a calculator, there's a Sony Walkman. Basically, every single one of these 15 products is now your phone, right? So it's, you, yeah, all, it's ev every single one of those things. And so as a consumer, this is amazing, right? I have 15 products that actually, if you add up the cost of all of them, your iPhone costs less than that. You have ease and simplicity, um, and, and then there's this question of does that kind of disruption mean that, that jobs are going to go away? And the history so far, and we can, we can spend a whole session just on are jobs going to go away or not, the big picture is that technology so far does create more jobs in the long run. Mm -hmm. So if you think about those 15 products, all the people who are working on building uh, answering machines and Sony Walkman, and then you compare that to the entire mobile industry. Mm. So everyone making phones, everyone working for network carriers, everyone building technology and software and apps for those phones, it dwarfs that. But if you were in the answering machine industry, which I right. guess was an industry yes. in 1991, probably in 1996, you were out of a job. If you look at um, Uber, so there's the Estimates about 220,000 people are taxi drivers, uh, limousine drivers, and shuttle drivers. A um, little over 200,000, there's 2 million Uber drivers. But if you were a New York City taxi driver, right. in 2014, the peak price for a New York City taxi medallion was a million dollars. 2014, by 2021, it was $80,000. Yeah. So part of the deal is those, those things are, yes, they're good for society, by and large. Yes, they, they uh, have created an environment where we work today 
in, uh, we work fewer hours in less dangerous conditions than we did 100 years ago. But every time those things happen, there are real shakeups and individuals who are the collateral damage of that. Right. And so, as from Indeed, we think about what are we going to do to help those people. But uh, part of my thinking is that people who are building this technology have to be conscious of the impact of the technology, just like Oppenheimer was in his reaction to having created this technology that, yep. yes, won the war, but what did it unleash? And I think that software in particular, um, because of the, how quickly this industry has grown up, there isn't a, a sort of ethical and philosophical grounding to it. And so there's a bunch of people who are creating things that are as powerful as Oppenheimer's you know, as a, weapon, as a, but without, yeah. without any awareness or thought to what is the impact, and I think that that's really missing. So let's, let's dig into that, although you absolutely have me in my feels with your Radio Shack um, uh, example. The first computer I ever had was a Tandy something. That's in the circular, and, right, and part, of the, part of the math, if you look at it, is that the iPhone clunk, today clunk, clunk, clunk. It was is, actually is floppy. 900 times as powerful as that Tandy computer, which cost like $1,300, which is what an iPhone costs today. No, it really is extraordinary when you think about it. It also reminds me that I was too old for the internet the first time around, <laughs> clunking on that thing. But I, I, I want to talk about the the real costs, both an opportunity cost and actual cost for leaving people behind. We talk about jobs, we talk about technology, the, the miracle and the magic of technology. But so for so many people and so many communities, they, they were not gonna have access to a good radio chef job anyway, right? It was just not, the, the, the um, answering machine dream was just not coming for lots of communities in, in the US and around the world anyway. So let's talk about the broader ecosystem here of of business and innovation in, in tech and beyond, whether it's in a startup or in a tech company or in a sort of a, an innovation pod within a bigger company. We're talking about um, investors, we're talking about builders, we're talking about I identifying the ideas that you're gonna invest in and scale. What is, what is it gonna take for anybody who's part of that ecosystem to begin to think about the um, unintended consequences of not only their technology, but people who aren't even part of the equation. Because at some point, we're talking about people who are from communities different from our own, or also people who we just don't think to compete for, either as talent or as customers. Yeah, so I think the, there's two sides to it. There's the, what is, what is the obligation, and then what is the opportunity? So, you, yeah. you know. Some people are, are never gonna look at it from a perspective of, of what is the obligation, but, but there's an opportunity angle too. So from the obligation perspective, um, you know, I, I look at other, first of all, all good science fiction starts with some technological invention that then has some unintended consequence on society. So this is like not a new concept, everyone going back to you know, Heinlein in, in the early days, like people, um, have the opportunity to sort of think about this. But the, the example that I like to use is in, in the medical field. So there's this Hippocratic Oath. And I, yeah. I would, if anyone is interested, the Wikipedia page for Hippocratic Oath is super fascinating. Really? It's like way bigger than, than one. First of all, there is no single one. There's, there's hundreds of different versions of it. And different. it's basically every school has their own. And there's a couple of standardized ones. But if you read the most common Hippocratic Oath, it actually reads like a really strong ethical manifesto for technologists in general, because it talks about treating, uh, when, you're, when you're treating a disease, recognize that you're not treating a tumor, you're treating a whole human being. Hmm. It talks about recognizing the privacy of your patients. And it, so it, all of these things that are, that are there as a foundation, and, and clearly doctors are doing things every day that are life and death, and so it's important to have this. Now, the other thing is that there's no enforcement of the Hippocratic Oath, but it is something that, is taught and everyone stands up before they graduate and has to, right. has to recite this thing. And so it's hopefully somewhere it in, gets in, the, in. in the yeah. ether yeah. there. Um, when I talk to people who are studying computer science, they're like, you know, what should I study? What classes should I take? My answer is always like, you should take philosophy, you should take a poetry class, you should study history. Because the problem is we have too many computer scientists who actually don't think about this stuff. I, I came to study computer science on a really weird and long path. Yeah, we're gonna get that, to that. We're that had me doing that. a whole lot of other stuff before I got there. And I think that I just um, naturally then look at problems as a human first problem and, and then sort of technology as a tool to solve those problems. But 
Um, so I think that we have an obligation as an industry uh, to, to educate people who are capable of making the, the type of decisions that will impact how this talks. So, you know, talk about AI right now and, yeah. and, and bias in AI. Um, and it shows up, there was a, a very famous situation when Google Photos started tagging um, objects that it could recognize and started tagging black people as gorillas. So horrific, but that's, that's sort of just a, uh, something that affects how, how people feel. You take the same concept of the issue being image recognition technology is trained on data that historically is like much more male and much more white. And so it's very accurate at identifying white male faces and very inaccurate in particular in white and uh, black female faces. Um, so you, you can see something offensive on Google Photos, but then if you look at that same technology used with border patrol or law yes. enforcement, they're potentially you know, deadly or, or in medical in medicine, uh, yeah. diagnostics where recognizing um, lesions and bruises on black skin yep. is, is much harder for the human eye and, and AI is, is typically pretty bad at that. So um, if you don't have people who are designing these systems and thinking about them from the start, then you take the problems that exist in society and you encode them and then mag magnify them and then they're really, really hard to get at and figure out later. So that's, that's the obligation side. I don't have a solution other than like it has to start when we're training people. Okay, because um, that was gonna be my follow-up question. Yeah, no, so it, was, it, it, it has to be, I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I went back to, I, I studied um, uh, computer science at Rice University and I, I got to go back for the 35th anniversary of the computer science department and that was my, my whole talk. Was, wow. on, was on bias in, in data and algorithms and how we have an obligation. I was sort of directly talking to the academics in the room saying like it's your job to, to teach people more than just data science and, and, and algorithms. Um, how did they receive that? Uh, a lot of interest. And so, I mean, it was maybe a, f a friendly audience because they knew what the talk was about if they showed you're up there. Kind of so I mean, you all, you all showed up at this talk, so you're probably you know, more, more open to some of these ideas than, than some other people. Maybe, maybe the, the Cathedral of Disruption doesn't want right. to hear about this as much. <laughs> um, but so I, so I, so I think there's, there's interest, um, but yep. I haven't seen anything happen yet. But then the, so that's the obligation piece. So then the opportunity. Um, there's a ton of opportunity in helping to serve underserved audiences of any kind. And so there's um, like the, the business school speak around this is there's blue ocean and red ocean strategies. Right. So the red ocean is you go into uh, an existing market and it's well understood and it's red because everyone's fighting each other and there's blood in the water. The blue ocean is a market that, that no one is looking at. And so um, Walmart, we talked about this earlier yeah. today, it's the, biggest company in the world by revenue, the most employees in the world, started by serving underserved rural communities um, who didn't have access to a whole host of products and offered them extremely inexpensively. Now, Walmart has its own, as, as a, as a, it's a very large business, has its own sets of challenges, but they built a very, very successful business serving a set of customers that nobody wanted. Right. Um, the other example that I love that's uh, just in terms of underserved markets is Rihanna. Um, who, you know, everyone knows as she performed at the Super Bowl that she, she is the wealthiest uh, singer in the world yeah. and not from, from singing. Uh, from singing. Yeah. So she recognized as a black woman that the 200 year old beauty industry made a set of products that were designed for a very narrow shade of skin tones. And so she came out with the, the first product from Fenty Beauty was this 40 shades of foundation. Um, and they did 100 million in revenue in the first five weeks and 570 million in the first 15 months of business. Yep. And now every major cosmetics company has multiple different shades and does the same thing. But it's, it's where are people looking at the opportunities for, for communities and, uh, and customers that are un underserved um, and, and ignored. And yep. I think that that's all of the stuff that we're talking about here. There's, so there is opportunity there as well. There is, and what's really poignant about those examples, and I have one of my own that I like, the, the Isuzu example, which I love, is that there is a healing effect when it's, it's not just a market opportunity to make money, it's a market opportunity to see the humanity of an entire group of people 
um, the fact that Rihanna, Rihanna thinks that um, is beautiful and she thinks that people of all hues are beautiful is new information for black and brown women around the globe. Right. They, are, they are now seen as um, equal in standard of beauty than the, the same white savior that always saves the day in, in science fiction. It's always like three beautiful white women are the only ones with certain hair that you can aspire to. And all of a sudden, women around the world, or people around the world with certain skin tones have tools to enhance their beauty and express themselves. That's the sort of healing piece in that opportunity, which I think is harder to do if you're just looking for a new market. You know, who, who's got faces that I haven't slapped my lotion on is not the exact same <laughs> thing as, right. you know, who can I really serve in their, the deeper reason why they want to wear makeup or where they want to buy a home. And I think that's the blue ocean piece that becomes the, the, the distinction within the disruption, right? Where we, we understand this, this, this consumer, this customer, we um, have customers like that, like them around the table who are inventing and co-creating this, and how, do we, and how do we begin to address this opportunity from that point of view? And I think that's, that to me is the revolution that you're really talking about. Right, and, and so but part of the Rihanna story is that she has this lived experience, so she was not a marketer sitting yep. in a room looking at focus groups, because the focus groups, right. you know, that, that was the old joke at, at Ford, is that if you, if you did focus groups and asked people what they were looking for, the answer was more cup holders. That was the thing that they heard from their customers. And <laughs> I no, thought you meant no Henry Ford. It was like a faster horse. Well, oh, so, so, so that, that's the old one, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, everyone says yeah. they want a faster horse. horse but, with but, a cup but, holder. but there was a big thing where, you know, no consumers are not saying, I want an electric truck. They're saying, yes. I want more cup holders. Yep. And so you have to have someone who's, who's thinking differently. So she has this, this lived experience, but also it's kind of like that she didn't come from business school and wasn't approaching things that way. And so I think having, I think it really helps to have a, uh, there's a, this, this gentleman that we spoke about earlier, Vincent Bragg, who was the yeah. CEO and founder of Concreates, which is a formerly incarcerated um, man who started an advertising agency that employs current and formerly incarcerated individuals. And part of his idea, and he said that I'd, I'd interviewed him on, on my, pad, my podcast, and, and the thing that he said that really stuck with me is the best way to solve an old problem is with a new lens. Mm -hmm. And so people coming from outside of the system, right. whatever that is, are gonna, they're just going to see things differently. And, and part of his pitch for why formerly and, and, and currently incarcerated people have a different creative approach to things is that um, they have to be creative yeah. in, in, to survive in, in the world they're in. And he has this thing of, you know, you, you look and you see a drug dealer and I see an entrepreneur. I see, right. I see someone who understands supply chain and competition yeah. and logistics. No, I mean, this is, but this is, a, this is yeah. a real thing. And so like, how do you create opportunity for people as employers? So we think about how to get people jobs all the time. Um, and this is, I'll just do the soapbox for a minute here. There's 77 million Americans with a criminal record. 77 million, that's one in three working age adults have a criminal record. And of all the bias and barriers that exist that stand in the way of someone getting a job, former incarceration is the only one where it's totally legal yeah. to discriminate. And, and people do. And, and the jobs numbers came out this morning and things are maybe starting to cool up, but there's still 10.8 million open jobs in the US. There's 5.7 million unemployed people, so there's 1.9 open jobs for every unemployed person. We're still in a historically tight labor market, and yet there's one in three working age adults who are sort of locked out of that entire yeah. opportunity space. So how do you bring a new lens to looking at people differently yeah. and, and seeing where there's where there's opportunity that everyone can benefit from. No, no, no. And it, it, when there's one definition of beauty or one definition of success or one definition of a investi an investing worthy entrepreneur, then it really is by design, right? right? But we should talk about Indeed because I think it's, um, it's easy to, I mean, it, it was, we, I, you are a philosopher king CEO. I mean, this is just <laughs> really how you operate in the world and it's easy to forget that, just, you, that you actually run a major technology company, all, a global technology company that is central to people's lives. So you're not on camera, so feel free to raise your hand. Who's mm -hmm. on Indeed right now looking for a job? <laughs> right now? <laughs> oh, I got you. <laughs> not at this moment, but you would, you, would, you would consider Indeed a resource for either looking for a job or talent. 
they'll admit to looking for other people. Yeah. <laughs> so tell we have us some customers up front here. Good, 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 good. Tell us a little bit about Indeed and just how dialed in you are to how the world actually works. Because I think that's an important part of this. So yeah, our mission is to help people get jobs. Uh, we have about 300 million people in 60 plus countries uh, around the world every month that come to Indeed looking for work. We have uh, millions of employers who do their hiring on Indeed. Um, companies started in, in 2004 with really just this very simple idea of there were at the time, hundreds of different job boards. So jobs were posted in all these different places. And why do I have to go to a dozen or a hundred different sites to find a job? And so yeah. we started by really just taking these jobs from everywhere and bringing them to one place, making it simple for job seekers to find what they were looking for. What, we're, what we've evolved to and where the real sort of power and growth has come from is bringing employers onto the platform. So we started just as a search engine. Right. So it was really finding jobs on, and actually the, the early, earliest version of the site, it said, you know, from, from, from job boards, career sites, and newspaper sites. So like, Aww. we were, I know, uh, <laughs> I know. So we were, <laughs> we were getting jobs from, from newspaper sites as well. <laughs> um, and we, and indeed, I mean, I, I will take responsibility. So this is the disruption thing. Like yeah. newspaper revenue, a lot of newspaper revenue came from want ads. Yep. And indeed was part of that. Now, the New York Times was an early investor and they, made good money uh, when Indeed was purchased. So like we helped the New York Times a little bit uh, That's with so that. nice of you. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Nobody's helped Fortune at all. <laughs> but so, so we started out as the search engine. We were sending clicks to all these other sites, which was great because it was helping job seekers. But then when we really looked at, if the mission is to help people get jobs, it's not to yeah. help people click on jobs. There's a lot that happens between clicking on a job and actually getting hired. So what we're focused on now is it's a, a two-sided marketplace where we have millions of employers who live on Indeed and they're managing the connections and the interactions with the candidates. We're bringing, the goal is to bring a human connection, right, to something that feels impersonal. And, and, and we also recognize our responsibility. At one point, we made it so easy for people to find and apply to jobs. People were applying to more jobs, which meant that employers were getting more candidates. And so we were sort of like creating another problem. And so the answer was to bring everyone together onto the platform. Um, and the big thing that, that happened with COVID was after years and years of trying to get people to actually interview, use video interviews on Indeed, and our customers told us forever, I need to sit face to face and have this conversation. That's right, I feel the vibe. In April of 2020, the request for video interviews on the platform from employers who were saying, I want a video interview went up by 1,600% pretty much overnight, wow. and so we built a new video interview platform, and now we can, because of that, yeah. we can very quickly and easily get someone from coming on, telling us what they're looking for, to talking to a human being, on average, within a few days, as opposed to several weeks, yeah. and so, but that's, our, our whole business is, is helping people get jobs, and, and really helping everyone, so that's the sort of difference between Indeed and other sites that came before it, and most that are around now, is that long haul truckers to CFOs and everything in between wow. in, in 60 plus countries around the world. So I know you're sitting on a lot of data as well and I, I, I want to talk about, you said there's a lot that happens from the time they get on the platform to get their job, but from a disruptive and community and social issues point of view, a lot happens to people from when they're born to they become an entry level employee, right. you know, or just, you know, the, the where we lose talented people from birth to C-suite is profound and I want to ask you, um, what you think businesses' role should be in those kinds of interventions. But first, I wanted to ask you, you last time I talked to you, you talked about COVID, the, this huge disruption to all of us, is that, that one of the elements that bubbled up as you're studying this community that you've built for a possibility in a job is um, that people are seeking meaning in new ways, and that's become a disruptive force. I think we got about 10 years of contemplation crammed into two years, and people are looking for something very different on all sides of the economy, which means that you were noticing that people were looking for jobs and opportunities that weren't in their core set or the things that they might have been looking for in 2019. What does that mean um, to employers now? And what is the, it's, media tends to want to label these things, you know, quitting and discontent and all this other stuff. But what is it, what, in your view, what does that really mean about what's happening at work? Yeah, so I think one of the, one of the big things that, that we saw, certainly ourselves as an employer, but, but in talking to our customers as well, is that um, people looked for something different at work within their job than they had looked to before because yeah. with, with the world suddenly turned upside down, 
And with what was going on at, at the time, it didn't really feel like there was any place to turn for answers or for help or for support. Yep. And so people were turning for their employers. And I mean, we had, you know, at the time, 10,000 employees who were sort of looking to, to the leadership team um, on a regular basis saying, like, help us understand what's going, like, take care of us. Yeah. Help us understand what's going on. I have kids that I'm trying to teach first grade and get them to sit down in front of an iPad for Zoom, and I'm working full time, and my uncle or my parent is sick, and I'm trying to process everything that's going on in the world around me. Um, and the only place that we were, because people couldn't really even talk to their neighbors, but for, you know, first of all, the working world was split, right? So there were yeah. people like Indeed or, you, yeah. you know, I mean, you, you work remotely anyway. Right. It was very easy. We were incredibly fortunate, yeah. right? We could, yeah. on a single day, send 10,000 people home and sort of deal with that. And then, then there was the rest of the world, which is the vast majority of the world, which had to keep going under yeah. circumstances that were so... Um, uncertain yeah. and needed protection and care like for their physical health That's and right. were looking to their, because their employer actually was the only one who was in a position to be able to provide that and in many cases were not. Right. So, um, so I think what happened on all sides, if you, if you worked in a grocery store and had to be showing up, if you were a, a, someone who could be working remote but were disconnected from people, in any of those cases people were looking for a lot more than just a paycheck. They were looking for answers, they were looking for support, mm -hmm. and there was a real st stark difference between the people who were seeing that and who weren't. And so in some of the industries where there was, so the, the food service industry might never be the same again. There's an right. estimated million people who left that industry who are just never coming back. No safety net, certainly no protection, um, but also just jobs that went away and closed and disappeared. And, and so now, I mean, you can't go to a restaurant anywhere without seeing a help wanted sign because yeah. there's just a, a, a structural shift that, that happened there. So, but we, the, the phrase that we used at Indeed was, you know, there was this great resignation thing. We, we sort of have been calling it the great realization. Um, That's that better. That's sort of less better. People just had a moment or a, a lot of moments to sit and think about what they wanted yeah. um, and what they were getting. And it's not that, you know, the vast majority of people don't have the luxury to just say, ah, I don't like this job, I'm leaving. Like most people in America and most people in the world have the job or the industry they're in and, and they don't have a lot of choices, yeah. but they certainly have spent a lot of time thinking they're about. Si they're sitting there thinking, yeah. About what it, 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 it is very clearly not a, uh, symmetrical relationship. Right. Um, and then the people who have the luxury to be able to make decisions about where they want to work, yeah. they definitely had a lot of thinking about, is, is this a place that I think is, is going to help me when things are difficult? And yeah. um, so that, that's created a huge amount of upheaval. But a lot of the, the great resignation thing, there's a handful of people that left the, the workforce, but mostly it was a lot of people jumping around and leaving places that they were unhappy and going to other places. And so um, it's actually, that's part of why the labor market is still so tight. Even though there were a lot of people jumping jobs, it was they were leaving one and going to another and just creating a new hole wherever they went. Right, that makes sense. And thank you so much. We started to see some of the questions coming in. Um, uh, oh, we've got a, a great one on um, manufacturers needing to fill 4.6 million jobs. So. Do you see a disruption in the job market to meet this need, asks Cassandra, and I think linking it to the other things that we've been talking about, is there an opportunity here to access the talent who was already scheduled to be eliminated by jobs in healthcare and retail um, long before COVID? Yeah, so I think this is, this is something that we do spend a lot of time thinking about, and part of what, what Indeed um, sees as our responsibility is that um, this disruption is happening all the time, and it's not, it's not impossible to see. It feels like it happens very quickly, and tech, technology disruptions, if you go back over the last 200 years, they used to take decades or a couple generations. So, you know, yeah. when, when the steam engine came around, it, it took a while before it impacted everyone's job, but now some of these things, I mean, chat GPT is the thing that people are most excited about, yep. uh, you know, musing over, but I think if you're a, a copywriter, uh, you know, 
um, it, it might be a, a frightening time, and it could ha that could happen very, very quickly, certainly in the amount of time it takes for someone to start an undergraduate degree in marketing and graduate, like in that length of time, your job prospects could, could change pretty, pretty rapidly. Um, but some of this, so that might have been a surprise, and, and people who study AI for a long time have said that the, the white collar jobs are actually the ones that are in bigger, bigger, uh, jeopardy. bigger jeopardy in the short term. Certainly a whole bunch of legal work, a whole bunch of medical diagnostic work, those things. And then, but then the, then the question is kind of like the, the earlier one. Is it, are the lawyers and doctors going away? Or the, you know, the general theory is no, there's just going to be doctors that use AI and doctors that don't use AI. Okay. And the doctors that use it more effectively as long as it's safe and fair and other things like that. And the lawyers who sue the bad and, AI yeah. makers. <laughs> the, yeah, that, that will happen. Uh, our general counsel is, is sitting here in the oh, front. I think, yes. yeah, he's. Uh, uh, wrap, him in, wrap him in bubble wrap. Yeah. Lawyer, the uh, lawyers are safe. Your vitamins. It's yeah. okay. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's worried about his son who's a doctor. Um, but the, uh, some of these things, I think, are not, if you, we're not very good as a society planning ahead. Mm -hmm. But so we know that something's going to happen with um, automated driving, right? So at some point, right. it's going to reach a point where it's just going to be, I mean, it's maybe already getting close to safer than the average driver. Yep. But it's just going to be safe and efficient and cheap. And there's 4 million drivers in the US um, that are going to be out of work pretty quickly. We don't have to wait until that happens, right? We can start to think about the fact, and it's, and it's not just drivers. When that happens, people don't talk about this, but the auto insurance industry yeah. like, doesn't need to exist anymore. Sorry for anyone that works in the auto insurance industry. But, um, so there's a whole bunch of things that people could be thinking about now and planning, and so that's the, where the Vincent Bragg theory comes in, is what, what are the transferable skills? That's one of the things that we're trying to do, is understand yep. Because of the work that you're doing, you might think, I can do this job, but you know, where do you see an entrepreneur? Where do you see someone else yeah. that has a different set? And so we're trying to understand what those are and to help push, put people in front of new opportunities and open those doors before where if you see the writing on the wall, you don't have to wait until the job disappears right. to start looking for something new. But the insurance example is a really interesting one because it's about risk and it's about managing risk and uncertainty in life. It helps people become whole. It makes people less violent. You know, they're not going to burn something down because they can't, they can't get, they can't get their home back. They can't get their car back. That kind of thing. And it's just become part. It's a tool. It's become part of the fabric of how we live and plan. So, but in order to be I never able thought about auto insurance as keeping people from burning things down. Well, you but, know, that's, but that's fair. Yeah. This, this is usually this is the conversation part that would usually happen at like the cocktail or chit chat afterwards. But I had a, um, a rev I had a, a revelation about insurance watching um, Slumdog Millionaire, which I'm not going to go into. But the only American couple, the only American people in the people from the U.S. in the film were horrified that a kid was being beaten after a car was was damaged, and the only thing they said was, "Why are you hitting him? Isn't it insured?" I'm like, oh. Insurance makes people less violent. It helps you to manage uncertainty and risk. So I, that's, that, that's the basis of yeah. my question. Is if we are assuming that all of these things are changing, they're changing quick, quickly, and they're changing. We've got lots of, um, uh, of AI and chat GPT observations here, and they're changing with data sets that already exist, and we're, we're going to be retrofitting them now as we go and building as we go. Then. Where is the intentionality? Where is the leadership? Where is the philosopher royalty piece of this where we start thinking more intentionally about how to manage the risks associated with living in, in our communities, that ones that we can't see? Because it, that really is sort of the ultimate job of an employer or an innovator or someone who's building something is that you're, you are responsible for training and developing and hiring and retaining people, but you're also responsible for how you operate in a community. That was a, that was a long walk from Slumdog Millionaire to uh, how to think about risk in a new way, because all of what you're talking about sounds to me like a new way of thinking about leadership and development and curiosity and how we talk to other people in the workplace. Yeah, so one of the things in, in the world of accessibility, so when we, you talk about in the physical world, making buildings accessible, in the, in the software world, how do you make your products accessible to, to yeah. people who have, who have sight great. or hearing impairment? Um, and most of the, of the dialogue from the, the community that's really focused on this is around the fact that we think of this as, oh, 
let's solve for the common case first, and then we have to like clean things up so it also works for other people. Right. Um, and and that and that that works as an analogy for sort of everything. But there's this really beautiful um, cartoon. So a, a, a friend, uh, Scott and Susan Smith. Susan, I had on my podcast. Also, they have two daughters who have uh, Friedrich's ataxia and type one diabetes. Oh, and wow. um, Susan is a disability rights activist and, and the amazing, just telling the stories of them as a family navigating um, these sort of life altering circumstances. And um, she just tells these very real stories about you know, her daughter's school going on a, uh, on a field trip. And they, you know, um, Stella is in, is in a wheelchair and um, it's always, something that at the very last minute someone says, oh, how is Stella gonna get from here to there as opposed to sort of thinking about planning the thing that works for Stella that could work for everyone else. And so she shared this, there's this cartoon that I'd never seen before, but it's sort of now become the, the sort of framework that we think about, which is uh, a bunch of kids um, in front of a school and it's, everything is covered in snow and there's a staircase and then there's a ramp off to the side and there's a guy shoveling the staircase and the, there's a, a kid who's sitting in a wheelchair who says, can you please shovel the ramp so I can get up into the school? And the guy shoveling says, well, I'm gonna shovel the, the staircase first, and then when I'm done with that, I'll come and sho shovel the ramp. And the kid says, if you shovel the ramp, we can, Everybody can. We can all get up through the ramp. Yeah. So, that's the, so the phrase that we use is shovel the ramp, right? And that, and that comes from, from Susan and from, from these other people. But if you think about designing software that is more accessible, it, it actually is just, means that it's easier to use, it's easier to, to right. see things, it's easier to navigate. That's definitely better for everyone. Designing products and, and buildings that are more accessible, it's not just for someone who's in a wheelchair. It could be a mother who's carrying a kid or someone who's carrying a box. It's, yeah. so, so I think that the model right. is, if you think about looking at the, the people that are at the margins that have the biggest challenges and you solve that problem, it actually, works for everyone, yep. and, um, and so that's part of, you know, we have had this opportunity because we have so many people on Indeed, and because it's not just white collar tech workers, it's literally everyone. You look at, you know, we just look every day at the queries that are coming in and the things that people are asking for, and then say, if we can figure out how to make it easier for the people that have the most difficult time, it just means that it's gonna be easier for everyone, and that, that's better for our business. We can create, uh, you know, it's a market, and we just want, you know, if I just use economic terms, we just want market liquidity, right? We want, as, we want to match as many people who are looking for jobs with the people who are looking to hire. And if we make it easier for the hardest cases, yep. then we can smooth the, the road for everyone. I am going to be irritating everyone in my life with my shovel the ramp advice. It's like I just cannot wait to drop it everywhere I go. It is a wonderful, wonderful metaphor. Where um, There's a, a wonderful question here, and thank you all. We really enjoy hearing your voices here. Um, two really are speaking to me. What is the main challenge in culture transformation in organizations to adapt to the new workforce demands that you talked about? I think that is a critical question here, and you're uniquely good at it. And I actually had a question similarly to it um, on my own, on my own um, notes, which was how you have learned to build an organization that thinks together that co-creates together. That's right. Well, I don't yeah. think there's any electronics yeah. there. Um, because I think that's an important piece of it. You're, you, as a leader, has to give up at some point um, the archetype person who knows all the answers, all information must flow through them. This, this is the thing that I cover in all my um, race and inclusive leadership reporting, is that how, how does culture change happen and become sustainably open, curious, shoveling the ramp. I'm so, never going to let that go. So one of our, um, so I, I've spent a lot of time at Indeed just using the phrase, I don't know, as like a really important, that's also, by the way, in the Hippocratic Oath. It's one of the points in the Hippocratic Oath is that you should never be afraid to say, I don't know the answer, mm -hmm. which is amazing. There's very few computer scientists who will ever tell you they don't know the answer to something. And I know because I work with a whole lot of them. Um, but, uh, but so we start, started early on. So one of the core values at Indeed, one of the things that I fell in love with when I first got there is um, we have, as you mentioned, we have an amazing 
set of data, and, and we've right. actually invested. We have this <laughs> extraordinarily data-driven culture. We have a huge amount of information that, with the proper protections in place, lots and lots of people can ask any question about what's going on in the business. We don't have a small team off to the side that like builds the reports and other people look. People can explore and look and, and ask and, and answer questions on their own. One of the things that happens with that is that the way that we build our products is through experimentation. So it is not some top down. And when I got there, this is, so this is, I joined the company in 2010. It was six years old at the time, but it was a real company. It was successful and growing. Um, and this was already established. And the idea was um, it, it doesn't matter what your job title is or how much you're paid. Your idea is no better than anyone else's until we test it and it actually demonstrates that it works. And so we, we run, we have, I, I was actually looking at this last week, we have about 6,000 individual experiments that are running, A-B tests that are running wow. across the site right now, today, um, from, from the <laughs> smallest things to very, very big, you know, sort of new product ideas that are, that are being tested against um, an existing uh, sort of baseline. And if you do that as a part of the culture, very quickly, you find out that your ideas are bad. So we have, we, have a, we have a ton of empirical evidence. We've run thousands and thousands of experiments, and we've compiled this over and over again, and it comes out exactly the same every time. We bat about 300. So about a third of the time, with all of the amazingly brilliant people we have with access to incredible amounts of data to make decisions in advance, two-thirds of our, of our ideas are bad. And it's roughly a third of them produce some positive impact, a third of them nothing, like literally no change at all, and a third of them are actively worse. And, um, and, and, that, and, I, and I promise you, anyone who's not measuring it, it's also the same, right? So if, if you're right. not measuring stuff, a third of the time you're making your business worse. Um, but it, it, it creates, whether you like it or not, a, a sort of you know, communal humility, because the answer is, I have no idea. And so, so I say out loud, and like one of our core values around innovation, but the, the sort of sub, uh, subtitle to it is that the, the greatest enemy to innovation is certainty. Right. Um, and that I have caused far more trouble in my personal and business life by being sure that I knew the answer to something right. and being wrong about it right. than being curious. So how, so how do we start? So I, this comes back to, I think it's really important for everyone and for like the whole leadership team to say, I don't know pretty frequently, and also to say, I was wrong pretty frequently. Um, you know, people sort of say, it's a lot easier to say, I'm sorry, than I was wrong. But like, I try to say I was wrong yep. as often as possible. But it's, it's a lot of work. It's not, you have, to, you have to design from the start and build everything on top of that. You can't just say, well, we've got this business, this is how we operate, and now we also want to be sort of open and collaborative to other ideas. Well, that def definitely seems to come naturally to you as well. Who are people leaders in here? Just who lead big teams? So I, I think the people leaders that I talk to in my reporting life are, come come to the job however they come to the job. But you came to the, you came to this job in a really specific set of ways <laughs> that I think lend yourself to being more curious and maybe maybe more humble. You use the word humble. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your background, if you wouldn't mind? Um. A nonlinear path. I, I studied architecture as an undergrad. Thought I, I was a kid of the '70s. Mike Brady was an architect. <laughs> Seriously, that, that's how I. That's that was the, he was the first architect I ever heard of. The uh, housekeeper slept in the laundry room. Yeah, there, there's issues on that show, <laughs> definitely. Um, but fell in love with buildings and houses and wanted to design them and went yeah. to college and halfway into the first studio class realized that I was terrible. I had like no talent. It was never going to happen. Um, but I ended up, I, I got a four-year degree in history and theory, of so basically an art history degree. Um, I uh, met my, my wife, who is here sitting in the front row, uh, and um, in college, and she moved to a small town in Vermont. My first job out of college was working at an adolescent psychiatric hospital on the chemical dependency unit, mm -hmm. working with young addicts and alcoholics. Um, I then packed up and moved to be with her in, in Woodstock, Vermont. And I taught public high school special education for a couple of years. Um, followed Lizzie to Los Angeles. She was going to grad school. And I played music professionally for two years, tried to become a rock star, and 
did not, um, <laughs> would do it all over again. Uh, and then she got a job at Rice University as an academic librarian in 1993. That's and, power, um, that's power. And I could uh, take undergraduate classes for free as the spouse of a staff member. And so I decided to go back to school and really kind of out of the blue, um, I mean, not totally out of the blue, but decided to try computer science. I had gotten, so 93, if you remember, I mean, it was pretty, pretty early, but I had a, a dial-up account on the well. Do you remember the yes, well? Yes, I do. So I was on the well, and the, so the well, for, for those of you who are younger, it was what we would now think of as a social network, sort of. It was an online community. Yeah, yeah. But it was people, it was, it was like Usenet, basically, but it was people all over the world, and for me, it was this first oh, there's somebody in Belgium who knows right. who Marvin Smitty Smith, who's the drummer for the Dave right. Quintet, who's it my favorite, but like nobody, I, I can't talk to anyone about Smitty, but magic. this person knows. And so it's like, oh, computer science could be interesting and just sort of found out that that was the thing that I should be doing. I just yeah. fell in love with it, but there was no idea, of, like I thought I was gonna be an academic and right. get a PhD and, and teach. And in the time that I was there, the mosaic, um, which yeah. was the first widely available web browser we were talking about. Mark Andreessen before he built Mosaic. <laughs> Mosaic uh, was released, the first version of the Java programming language, the Linux operating system, and Amazon.com. Yeah. All launched in the three years that I was in grad school, and suddenly right. it was this whole Explosion. different world. And so I ended up going into tech, but I had had a life before doing a bunch of other things. And um, so my approach to it, yeah, I guess I, I thought about it a little differently. Well, and blessed are the older moderators because we always get the reference, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so that's a, that isn't. So, your best advice then, because you are also a people leader, and so many people need to be on the board at the table if we're going to design the better products and services and software and technology that's going to meet the needs of people around the world, but also the pressing issues that technology has either created or ignored, right? So, what is it's, we can't have system redesign if the designers aren't prepared to see the system as it actually is. So what have you learned about how to open your eyes to how to make yourself a work in progress? I have one example that inspired me was your, how you changed your reading list, but you may have others. Yeah, so that, that was a big one. Um, and just sort of briefly, uh, about five and a half years ago, um, I read a book called Brotopia by Emily Chang, uh, Emily is here uh, doing another panel later today, um, that's about basically um, patriarchy and misogyny in tech from 1950 to the present. It's an amazing book. Um, it includes a chapter on a company that I worked at um, that uh, was 100% <laughs> accurate and, and also um, you know, a little jarring to, to sort of see the, the, the role and because part of the thesis is there was a shift from the sort of shy, nerdy, introverted technologist to sort of the frat party that we see in, in Silicon Valley today. Um, and, uh, and so I, I looked at the stack of books on my bedside table and realized at, at the time it was like, oh, I'm reading only men. And so I'm, I was going to spend the summer just reading women authors and then Sort of the third book in, I read uh, Americana by mm. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and, and then I realized, oh, I'm only reading white authors. And so I um, decided for a short period of time, it's now five and a half years in, that I was just going to read um, books written by people of color. Um, and it's been, it's been as intense a, a study as, um, as any other thing that I've ever sort of been been transformed by, and part of it is because it, it is so hard as a straight, white, cis, able-bodied, otherwise, you know, uh, privileged and, and powerful kind of person by birth, um, to do anything other than, than sort of touristically understand these. So like, yeah. you can watch a movie, you can have a conversation that really gets you thinking, and then you go back to your life right afterwards. Right. Um, but I've, I've spent a period of time just with a new lens, changing the way that I, I look at things and, and then changing who I spend time listening to. Um, I mean, I, I started at, at Indeed uh, last year. I'd been meeting once a week with um, just a random group of people for lunch, whatever office that I was in. 
and then started doing that over Zoom. And then at the beginning of last year, decided I'm, I'm just going to, you know, so now twice a month, I meet with a small group of black women at Indeed, just three to five people at a time. And again, I could have done that once. Right. Um, and I would have learned a lot, but it's, I've been, I've now met, uh, I think it's like 120 people, and we're like 28, 29 sessions in. Um, and anecdote sort of turns into actual data when you have conversations over and over and over again. And, and relationships. Not, right, and it's, but it's not just one person saying, here is my experience, that I'm seeing patterns over and over and over again, that even with all the work that we're doing, it's very, very clear yeah. the, the types of experiences that someone who is marginalized has walking into the same space that I walk into. Just like I have no reference point for it, right. unless I really dig it. So I don't, I don't know how to do that in a casual way. Right. Um, other than read a book and see a movie and right. you know, scratch your chin for a couple minutes. But, right. So for me, it's been, it, it, it has been a new lens. And again, that's the, the sort of shovel the ramp philosophy um, has, been, has become more embedded from that experience. Right. No, no, that makes perfect sense. Thank you for that. Because we had a question about vulnerability in mm -hmm. leadership, and I think that helped paint the picture of how you're trying to systematize that. Um, Thomas asks correctly that we're, if we're moving, as he believes, towards a larger distance between jobs available versus people needing jobs, considering AI evolution and other technology, um, what is, how to think about the future, and Thomas, if I, may add, may add, if I may add on, what is our role in thinking through that future? Yeah, so I think this is a, a super tricky topic because, you know, Everyone, AI is certainly a different level of, of power than other technologies that have come before it. Um, but there's two camps, right? So there's a, the set of people who say that AI is just like everything else, right. and it's going to be, you know, there's going to be a period of disruption, and then there's going to be doctors using AI and, and lawyers using AI, and, and, and it's going to be better for everyone. Um, and then there's people who say, like, it's over. And there's going to be, you know, 90% of people are not going to have anything to do, or we're all going to die, right? So I mean, there, that that's yeah. the sort of the the, the third <laughs> angle to that. Um, I, anyone who says they know the answer, don't, you know, just treat everything else they say with some skepticism because yeah. it's impossible to know the answer. I tend to fall into the I believe it is like other technological advances. I think it's going to be more disruptive because it's just happening so quickly. I mean, like, again, ChatGPT is just a silly little tool, mm -hmm. but the amount of freakout that has happened as a response to it, yeah. um, both from people on the job side, but then other, you know, I have my closest friend is uh, an English professor. And we've spent the last you know, 25 years talking about the arms race between kids cheating and English professors trying to catch them cheating, and, <laughs> which, is a, which is a huge deal. It was it's a lot like, harder to cheat when we were yeah. you know, in, in school. And um, the, the technology for the, on the teacher side before this had actually advanced, because there was, you know, most people were cheating by finding stuff off the internet, and there was a big database of the stuff so they could feed a paper in and saw who stole what from, from where. With ChatGPT, it's out. I mean, he's been having you know more. He is now the, the department chair for English at uh, Utah State, and uh, and like every single department chair, the department meeting is about ChatGPT right now. They're not talking about hiring. They're not talking about anything else. Um, so I do think. Uh, so I don't believe that like universal basic income and that we're going to need to figure out you know create farms for people to sit around and do nothing. I don't think that we're headed there. But I think we're headed for big periods of massive, so the kind of disruption that we've seen, mm -hmm. it's going to happen quicker when four million drivers are out of work overnight or entire fields just sort of shut down because from a capitalism perspective, it makes sense to, you know, this is a, a great thing. We can do this. Let's take advantage of it. So um, in this country, at least, there's, there's definitely no protection for, for workers. So we have to plan ahead mm -hmm. for it. But I don't think personally, and I so don't trust anything that I say. I don't think we're going to be at structural unemployment is what, what that thing means. Another good Wikipedia page if anyone's interested. Okay. Um, structural unemployment means that basically there's such a, a massive change that a whole host of people will just be out of work and be out of work forever. Um, 
but I, but I think the, dis like the cycles get faster and faster and the disruption itself yep. gets bigger and bigger. So we're gonna, we're gonna be dealing with societal upheaval as millions of people find themselves out of work for a short period of time. And, and indeed, as we're doing everything we can. We're not gonna be able to single-handedly solve this yeah. problem, but we take this very seriously and we wanna figure out how do we as quickly as possible get people placed and hopefully other people are thinking about that too. Okay. All right, we've got a few minutes left. Let's do a couple of right lightning round questions and then sure. I'll let you wrap up. Uh, cities are pushing for workers to return to in-office to support local economies. How will this play out? So that's a, that's a really interesting one. So one of the things that, that we look at, um, and, and we have time, so if anyone's interested in, in interesting economic labor data, hiringlab.org, hiringlab.org, uh, we have a, a team of brilliant economists who have access to all of the data that other labor economists have, but then they have access to all of our data. So it's a supply and demand kind of view. And one of the things that we saw in the, the early days of the pandemic was that the overall impact, negative impact um, to employment was directly related to the percentage of workers in a city wow. that could work remotely. So San Francisco, all of the retail around downtown San Francisco, so all of the, the restaurants, the dry cleaners, all those places, they were devastated. Right. Where places where that had a lower concentration, there was less of a, a, a follow on impact there. Um, so I, I understand this story. I mean, if people, yeah. and like, I don't know if people are ever going back to San Francisco, honestly, the, the occupancy rates there. Austin has the highest occupancy rates um, of, of businesses of also anywhere in the country. These companies that do the badge swipe data, the, yeah. there was a big thing the journal wrote about a while back. Um, but San Francisco is, is the lowest right now. And so I, I think that those, those are really important questions. I don't know that the way to get people to go back to an office is to appeal to supporting the, like, I don't know that that's gonna work, but that's, that's the reason yeah. why it's gonna be important. I think part of the challenge is the, d does it make sense living in the Bay Area with the kind of commutes you have right. if you don't have to come to work to come to work? So you, I think those are tough problems. Yeah, if you don't have a jet pack, no, I get it. Bailey's in college right now. ChatGPT has been banned in half of their classes. <laughs> Bailey is doing their own work. Thank you for that. Um, yes, what do, you, do you think that allowing this tech could be advantageous within academia? Do you see a path forward? So in the future, I definitely think that this, I mean, in the same way that that's like, there was questions about should you be able to use Google in school? Like, mm -hmm. yes, um, I think that it-, it Or that like if, a calculator, if, but this, this right, seems a right, little yeah, more I mean, intense. If we, if we had access to, to Google when I was studying computer science, like it's amazing what's out there. I think the, the problem, at least with chat GPT today, is that it's wrong about a lot of stuff. And yep. so that, and there was this amazing uh, <laughs> uh, academic researcher who, who basically gave it a prompt and it, and, it, and it wrote an abstract and a detailed bibliography for, um, for work in their field that when they looked at said, this is amazing and none of those things actually existed. Right. And so the, 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 the challenge is that, is that those large language models don't really, uh, part of what they, the term they use, which I love, is they're hallucinating, right? So they, they take these ideas and they create, that's what the, the researchers who are building these things saying that, yes, yeah, it's, hallucinating. The, it, it's hallucinating, it's coming up with new ideas. So um, I think if you understand what the limitations are, yep. I think absolutely it will help bring knowledge forward. But like right now, I don't think ChatGPT is gonna be super helpful um, if you're trying to write a paper. All right, you go, Bailey. We believe in you. Shireen, we, we have just a minute or so left. Yeah. Shireen would like you to stand for Gen Z and their bad reputation that they are uh, here to disrupt for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's the duty of every generation to look down on the generation that followed them and to be totally blind to the fact that you are that to, to your parents and the generations before you. Um, I have 25 and 27 year old daughters. We have a lot of debates about are they millennials or Gen Zs. They're pretty sure they're millennials, but the 25 year old is right on the border. Yep. Um, but it's, it's sort of, uh, I think that um, anyone that, ignore, that spends all of their time looking down and saying it's all, it's all ridiculous is, uh, is going to miss out on a lot. Um, I can enjoy TikTok as much as anyone else, so there I'm, I'm all for Gen Z. I, there you I go. stand with Gen Z. There you go. Well, <laughs> well done. That is a great place. Be oh, nice. I didn't mean to step on the applause. No. <laughs> Gen Z, you are the future. 
So Chris, thank you so much for talking with me and bringing me back to South By, and I love hanging out with every one of you, and thank you all for being here and your thoughtful voice. Is there anything we didn't touch on and we should have? Is there anything that you want to leave us with before I reluctantly let you all go? Um, really, I mean, I think the shovel the ramp thought. So like, if you haven't seen it, just, just Google shovel the ramp, you'll see the cartoon. Like, we have people who printed it out and stuck it up on their, on their monitors. That, that to me is a really, like all of the debates about who we are and what our role in society and business is and taking care of people who are at the margins. And you look at what happened in COVID and the cost that we all paid from having ignored so many people for so long. I think that yeah. you, know, you either pay for it in the end or if you can think a little more broadly and, uh, and more openly, um, I would like us to think preventative instead of palliative uh, yeah. as a society. It's a more hopeful way to be. Yeah. I want to thank the entire village of people who got South by to get South by Southwest together, got us prepared to be here safely and talk about this important thing. And I wish you all very, very well in the rest of your lives and your day and your experience here. And thank you so very much. Thanks.